Hi guys, Dane here, and today I am going to be very belatedly... Does that make sense? That's probably correct English. I'm going to be very belatedly revealing my top books of Q3, so from July, August, and September of this year. Let me get the stack. Oh! Here is the stack. Counting down from number 10. We have The Rats by James Herbert. Now, my mom actually got me a copy of this. I think there was like one lying around at her um, her book exchange at work. But also, there's a sort of a story at my dad's side of the family. Um, we used to have this hamster. And my dad was watching Deadly Eyes, which is the movie version of this. Which I still haven't seen. I can't find it anywhere. But um, he was watching that and then he turned around and the hamster had escaped from his cage and was just sitting on the chair behind him. So... Um, that's not what you want when you're reading a story about rats. I think James Herbert's been called Britain's Answer to Stephen King, and you can kind of see that here. It's basically just a horror story about evil rats that, well, not evil necessarily, they're just, I don't know what you would call them, rabid, crazy, aggressive. So um, you don't want to get in their way, certainly. And if you get bitten by them, you're pretty much screwed anyway. A bit like, uh, you know, a zombie bite or something like that. I uh, really enjoyed it. It's quite a short read as well, so uh, I would definitely recommend it if you're into horror. But not if you're squeamish. Okay, in at number 9 we have The Blind Watchmaker by Richard Dawkins. So, this book's kind of old now, but it's still a very important book, I think. It's basically dispelling the arguments against the theory of evolution. So, um, one of the big arguments is, you know, well... Uh, the eye, for example, is so perfect, you can't have half an eye, so it must have been designed by a watchmaker, you know, a metaphorical watchmaker. And Dawkins explains that evolution itself is a blind watchmaker, basically. It doesn't know what it's doing, it's putting parts together, it might succeed, it might not. And uh, he also gives a lot of the science in it as well, behind how actually things like eyes develop. So, for example, the early eyes, perhaps all that you could see, tell was the difference between light and darkness. Even then, that would be a major advantage over other, you know, other animals, other members of your species. So, you can develop parts of eyes slowly, you know, and they'll slowly upgrade over time. So, very interesting. It was one of my bedside books. Okay, in at number eight, we have Neil Gaiman, uh, and illustrated by Chris Riddell, Fortunately the Milk. So this is basically like a little kid's story uh, about, it's like a meta story. So the dad goes out, the dad goes out to get some milk, and uh, he takes forever. And when he comes back, the kids ask him what happened, and then the dad tells this story. And I like as well that the, uh, the illustrations of the dad, I mean, it is Neil Gaiman, look at him. And uh, it's just very cute, kind of quite funny as well. I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm, no, I'm not a child, but I did enjoy it. And if you do have children, they probably will enjoy it as well. Okay, here we have, uh, what are we, number seven. This is Earth is Room Enough by Isaac Asimov. So this is a collection of short stories. I will read you the titles actually of them. So we have The Dead Past, The Foundation of SF Success, Franchise, Gimmicks 3, Kid Stuff, The Watery Place, Living Space, The Message, Satisfaction Guaranteed, Hellfire, The Last Trump, The Fun They Had, Jokester, An Immortal Bard, Someday, The Author's Ordeal, and Dreaming is a Private Thing. And it's that last story there that I particularly enjoyed reading because there's an album that I like of like psychedelic music and it's called Program 10. And that's called, sorry, the song on it, the track is called Program 10 and Program 11, but the album's called Dreamies and it's based on that short story. So the idea behind this story is there are professional dreamers who have these dreams and then the dreams get recorded and then companies sell them to people. And uh, yeah, it was just interesting to finally read that story after loving that album for so many years. And it was a nice little bonus because it was the last story in the collection and I didn't know it was gonna be in there as well. The only problem I did have with this is that the print is tiny, look at that. My finger for reference. Number six, we have Truman Capote, In Cold Blood. This is another one that I actually read as a, one of my bedside books. It's not because I found it boring or anything like that. It was just very, it's heavy going, you know. You have to, you have to just, just stick with it and keep going through it. But I did find it absolutely fascinating. It's kind of the, the forefather of all true crime, really. I did this as a buddy read as well. What I would say is, uh, so the first section of it is the, uh, the last to see them alive. And... Basically, that's setting the scene, but it, it goes on for quite a while, and I got a little bit bored of it after a while. And um, 
I was a bit worried at that point. I wasn't sure if I was going to enjoy it, but then as I got further into it and kind of got more absorbed into the case and more of a kind of a grip of, you know, who the big players in it were, you know, who the sheriff was and who this was and who that was. So, uh, yeah, I, I did enjoy it and would recommend, especially if you're into crime. If you're into, like, true crime on Netflix, you'll like that. In at number five, we have J Javier... In at number five, we have Javier Marias, Madame du Dauphin and the Idiots. And I'll read you the blurb here because it's nice and short. Five sparkling, irreverent, brief portraits of famous literary figures, including libertines, eccentrics and rogues, from Spain's greatest living writer. So this was part of the Penguin Mini Moderns box set that I read. It's also notable because I think 48 of the 50 books in that were by dead authors. So this is one of the ones that is actually alive. But I guess then it, it relates back to other famous authors. So for example, we've got here uh, Emily Bronte, The Silent Major, Oscar Wilde after prison, Nabokov in Raptures. And just, it's just a great bookish book, you know, nice and short as well. I would just heartily recommend this if you're into literature, you know. Okay, in at number four is Fame by Andy Warhol. So uh, the blurb here is the legendary pop artist Andy Warhol's hilarious, gossipy vignettes and aphorisms on the topics of love, fame and beauty. Now I'm not necessarily a massive Andy Warhol fan, but I did like uh, some of the ideas in this, and uh, it's, it's quite philosophical in some ways, and other ways it's just really beautiful. I mean, he didn't necessarily write this, this is really a collection of things that he said, but I still enjoyed it. You can be just as faithful to a place or a thing as you can to a person. A place can really make your heart skip a beat, especially if you have to take a plane to get there. I think a lot about the people who are supposed to not have any problems. You get married and live and die and it's all been wonderful. I don't know anybody like that. They always have some problem, even if it's only that the toilet doesn't flush. There we go. In at number three, we have And the Ass Saw the Angel by Nick Cave. So this was recommended to me by my friend Amy. And uh, actually, so that, in fact, it wasn't even that. I'd already got a copy of this. And then she mentioned it was her favorite book. And so I was like, I should probably pick it up and read it then. Really enjoyed it. It's kind of like psychedelic, quasi-religious madness it reminded me a bit actually of stephen king's dark tower books in that it's just this sort of strange world it's set in this strange almost this western world but again this is also quite philo philosophical as well um i mean i'll read you the blurb because i can't really describe what it's about outcast mute a lone twin cut from a drunk mother in a shack full of junk Eucharid Eucro of Eucalor inhabits a nightmarish southern valley of preachers and prophets, incest and ignorance. When the God-fearing folk of the town declare a foundling child to be chosen by the Almighty, Eucrid is disturbed. He sees her very differently, and his conviction and increasing isolation and insanity may have terrible consequences for them both. Give it a read. Especially if you like sort of experimentalist stuff, I guess. In at number two, we have Indisputably Doris by Charles Heathcote. This is book number two in his Our Doris series. I actually think I enjoyed this more than the first book. So in the first book, basically Doris is... Well, I should... All right, to clarify. So Doris is Doris Copeland. And she's sort of a, an elderly woman. She lives with a long-suffering husband, Harold. I dropped my H on her husband then as well. It's all set in kind of the north of England. It's a very British sense of humour, very reminiscent of keeping up appearances, that kind of thing. In the first book, uh, Doris is uh, trying to win the local garden safari. In this one, she is trying to be elected as chairwoman of the Women's Institute. And like I say, I do think this was actually better than the first one. And uh, I heard some talk on his channel. Uh, he's on YouTube, so check him out. Uh, heard some talk on his channel that uh, he's making some, making some progress on book number three. So I am excited about that. And finally, in at number one, it's Heart Shaped Box by Joe Hill. I think the thing about this book is that it really stuck with me and uh, the ghost in it really kind of creeped me out for quite a long time. There were some particular, uh, particular uh, scenes in it as well that was just really stuck in my head. It's basically about this aging rock star who buys a ghost on eBay and then it arrives inside a heart shaped box and uh, turns out to be a real ghost. And he's not quite prepared for it, and then we start to discover a bit more about his past, about his uh, ex-girlfriend, and I, I, what I like as well is the kind of redemption arc throughout it. He's really kind of fundamentally unlikable by, at the start, but by the end, you just you want him to you want him to survive, you know. So um, I don't want to say too much more about it because I don't want to ruin it. But if you like a good ghost story, check this out. Also, he's Stephen King's son, so you know it's going to be good. 
So there we have it. Those are my top 10 books of Q3. Sorry I'm late with this. I'm late with everything at the moment, but I'm trying to get some filming done at the moment, which is why I'm losing my voice. And then I just need to edit these and get posting. So yes. So anyway, thanks a lot for watching. Let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books and if so, what you thought about them. Hit that like button. And <laughs> hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.